Hi, I'm Emma, and welcome to my channel. In the last video, we learned that computers can do math. Shocking, I know. In this video, we'll learn how computers can make decisions, also known as control flow statements. Hold up, though. You might be saying, Emma, I understand most of what you just said, but aren't statements something you get from your bank? And I would say, okay, you got me. I slipped into programmer speak for a minute there. But honestly, we don't have a lot of simple words to describe certain patterns of symbols and keywords in code. So we end up using programmer ease to keep them all straight. So let me take a detour into what a few of these words mean so that you'll know what I'm saying as we start talking about larger chunks of code. First off, let's define what an expression is. In Java, an expression is a sequence of variables, operators, keywords, or other parts of the Java language that, once executed or evaluated, will produce a single value. A single expression can be used to build more complex expressions. But expressions by themselves aren't complete. They're only fragments. We can assemble various expressions together to form a statement. If expressions are nouns and verbs, then statements are sentences. And as you've seen quite a few times by now, in Java, a semicolon marks the end of a statement. The last type of code structure is a block. A block is a way to group individual statements together as one unit. If expressions are nouns and verbs, and statements are sentences, then blocks are like paragraphs. Anywhere a single statement is allowed, you can put a block instead. A block is formed by a pair of matching curly brackets. Statements that are between the pair of curly brackets are considered inside of the block. You really want to pay attention to these formatting and punctuation rules, called syntax. If they're not right, you'll have a bunch of red squiggly lines in your editor. I can't count how many times my code wouldn't compile, and it was simply missing a semicolon, or had the wrong number of closing curly brackets. Alright, enough about syntax for now. Let's dive into control flow. When we want the code to make a decision, we can use an if statement. It has three parts, the if keyword, an expression inside a pair of parentheses that serves as a test, and then a statement to execute if the test expression is true. For that last part, remember that we can put a block wherever a single statement is allowed. You should pretty much always do this, because single statements can lead to hard to diagnose problems. For the test expression inside the parentheses, you can use any expression, as long as it evaluates to a boolean true or false. My advice is to keep it as short as you can, because really long expressions can be really hard to follow. If you just have an if statement and the test expression is false, then the code in the block is not executed, it's just skipped. If you want to have some code that executes when the test is false, then you can use the else keyword and follow it with a block. This becomes an if-else statement. But sometimes you need to check one thing after another and run some code for each condition. This happens a lot in FCC game designs. The ref rolls a dice and randomizes a game piece to one of three different locations. One way of handling this is to chain your statements together using an else-if statement. What this might look like is if game piece position equals one, then drive to location one. Else if game piece position equals 2, then drive to location 2. Else drive to location 3. If you have a condition that can be expressed by a single variable with different values for each case, then you can make use of a switch statement. It's very similar to the else if chain we described a moment ago, but with a slightly different structure and a gotcha you should watch out for. It looks like this. First, the switch keyword. Then, a variable in parentheses and then curly brackets for the start of a block. Inside this block, for each case, you use the case keyword, a value for the case, and then a colon. Below this, you can put whatever code you want to run for that case value. These cases serve as places that the code will jump to. However, for each case statement, there's one important thing to add. 
The last line in each case statement needs to be the keyword break. If you forget this, the code will keep executing or fall through into the next case section. Most of the time, you don't want this. The break statement makes the code jump out of the switch block. There's also a special form of a case statement. You can use the keyword default instead of the case keyword, and if none of the cases match, it will jump to this location instead. It's a bit like an else block for a switch. Okay, now that we've talked about making decisions in code, what if we want to go back and run the same code multiple times? We call this a loop, and Java has a few variations. The most simple of these is a while loop. It looks like this. The while keyword, a boolean test inside parentheses, and a curly bracket block. As the code executes, it first checks the test, and if it's true, it executes the code in the block. After it's done executing the block, it jumps back up to the beginning and checks the condition again. It will keep running the code in the block as long as it stays true. The moment it becomes false, the loop will end and continue running code after the while block. But what if you know that you want to execute code a certain number of times? Well, you could use a while loop and a counter to make this happen. Here's an example. Let's imagine you want to run something 10 times. You can create a variable called count and start it at zero. Then in your while loop condition, you can test if the count is less than 10. Inside your loop block, you can add one to the count with count plus plus. This kind of code, a loop with a counter, is so common that Java provides a special statement as a shortcut. It's called a for loop. Let's go back and inspect our while loop for a moment. There's a section of code where we do some setup, usually initializing a counter variable. Then we have a condition expression that tells the code when to terminate the loop. And finally, we have a spot where we adjust the counter after each loop executes. A for loop combines all of these into one statement. Like our while statement, it goes keyword, parentheses, and code block. But this time, there are three statements inside of the parentheses, separated by semicolons. In the first statement, we declare and initialize our counter variable. We used count before, and we could use it here, but I'll use the traditional i as the counter here. So int i equals zero. A semicolon ends the first part. Now we define the condition that will end the loop, i less than 10, another semicolon, and finally, we'll increment the counter, so i plus plus. There. This for loop will now run 10 times. Each time, the i variable changes from 0 to 1, 2, 3, on up to 9. Since we started at 0, it will exit when it reaches 10. We talked about the break keyword earlier when talking about the switch statement. It was a way to jump out of the switch block. It works with loops as well. Usually, it's used with an if statement to exit the loop early, typically when a condition changes. An example of this might be driving a robot to a certain spot on the field, but stopping the driving loop early if a sensor detects an obstacle. You should be careful with loops in FTC robot code. As you might have guessed by the names of the op mode methods in it and loop, there's already a loop somewhere else in the code. This main loop needs to run quickly, so it's important not to delay it with a different loop that keeps waiting for a condition to happen. The exception to this is if you are using a linear op mode. This is a special op mode that executes your code at the same time as the main loop is running. So it's okay if your code waits for something to happen in a loop. Now that we've covered the building blocks of variables, operators, and control statements, let's see how we can package all of this up into something called a class. See you in the next video.